let's talk about those. George, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Pivotal Study? Why don't you tell us a little bit about the design, why it was designed like that, the subtypes you looked at, and, and delve a little bit into the results. Yeah, so it really, the Pivotal Study is an interesting thing because there are two Pivotal Studies. There was a little randomized study back in 2005 or so that was done with all soft tissue sarcomas in it where it was a very low dose regimen compared to the now standard dose regimen where the standard dose regimen won. And after a lot of discussion, the European version of the FDA approved it as a therapy for patients who had already had anthracycline-based chemotherapy because they said the sarcoma field needs something like this, and this drug certainly, when you compare the homeopathic inactive dose to the active dose, it was doing something to control the disease. The response rate, as Marty said, is quite low, 8 to 10 percent at best. But when it works, and if you're one of those 8 to 10 percenters, it can actually have some very nice objective responses. And even beyond that, the benefit is not measured by the objective response rate, as I think mm -hmm. Mark said before. The benefit is a combination of the objective response rate and durable disease stability, which to me means more than six months of disease control. Yeah. And there were a good 40, 50 more percent of patients in that early study who had that kind of benefit. And then a tail on the curve of about 20 percent who were out past a year or two years. So that was the first approval for Europe. And as Marty said, the US FDA said, nope, we need a little bit more data. So we went back to the drawing board and designed the most recent phase three study that all of us participated in pretty much, along with Brazil and Australia, because they also had the same issues from their regulatory agencies. And essentially, we replicated the outcomes. The outcomes were the 24-hour uh, infusion of trabectin was compared to an older drug, the carbazine, old name of DTIC. And it controlled the disease better, about almost a three-month progression-free survival rate, very similar to what pezopinib did. But pezopinib was controlled against a placebo control. This was controlled against an active control of decarbazine. And one can say, well, decarbazine isn't very active, but I think we've undervalued the value of decarbazine in leiomyosarcomas right. in particular. So I actually think it was kind of a high bar for trabectidin to jump over, and it did better both for the leiomyosarcomas in terms of disease control as well as for liposarcomas. Yeah. And that actually came out of the older experience that the liposarcomas and the leiomyosarcomas conveniently, both of which yeah. start with L, but other than that have no biological similarity, <laughs> were called the L sarcomas, just for shorthand, but that name kind of stuck. Yeah. And now people think about using trabectidin for L sarcomas, yeah. both lipos and lios, and the data support that. Yeah. So I think those are the issues. It was FDA approved on the basis of that. I think it was very interesting that the FDA then said, fine, now we have hundreds more patients that study almost 600 patients. And I think it was a, a patient-friendly decision on behalf of the agency to, to let it go out commercially. I think the important thing, again, with this is to discuss the potential side effects. We talked a little bit about the vesicant side effects. We always tell people, well, you have to have steroid premedication, so you'll have those side effects. I have some asthma, and I've taken steroids, and I know what it's like to be up at 6 in the morning vacuuming because you've got a lot of energy from those steroids. So that's one issue. But it does decrease the risk of hepatic toxicity. And then you have to monitor for mid-cycle uh, transaminases because something about trabectidin can bump the transaminases and in some patients could indicate some more worrisome hepatic damage that would require a dose reduction to mitigate. The nice thing, though, is that even if the hepatic uh, transaminases go up, they come back down again in virtually every patient so that patients can stay on their every three-week cycle, and there's no cumulative buildup of this. Again, we've had patients who are on cycle 60 of this drug and have no cumulative problem with their liver. It's, it's a remarkable drug. Yeah. And, and just to monitor CPK2 to throw that in there because that's a parameter. But so, so one last thing, talk a little bit about the nuances of liposarcoma because I think it's important. You know, we spoke about diseases like synovial sarcoma and we have this disease mixoid round cell liposarcoma that can often be sometimes very exquisitely sensitive to alkylators and very exquisitely sensitive to anthracyclines. But gemcitabine and docetaxel, probably not the best regimen for it. And, and Yandelis, and, and how does it compare, or, or trabectidin compare to the mixoid round cell versus, say, a well diff D diff? Yeah, well, I, I think most of us feel that trabectidin is a drug of choice from mixoid and round cell. And this does get back to the mechanism. Uh, if this is the double-stranded DNA, trabectidin tends to bind right in the DNA minor groove. 
displaces the way the DNA is binding. And when that happens, it probably knocks off various transcription factors. The myxoid and round cell liposarcoma is characterized by a special translocation that creates a weird transcription factor that probably is sticking to the DNA differently. Trebectidin can knock it off. And that probably explains why it has such activity in myxoid and round cells. It's been published before that the activity can be upwards of even 60% benefit, maybe even 80% benefit in the right patient population. Again, myxoid and round cell is probably a bit of a heterogeneous disease itself, so I never say to any patient, you can bet this is going to work for you, but it's certainly got a higher chance of working in that than perhaps in well-differentiated liposarcoma, which tends just to sit there and stay stable anyways. But again, you can't predict. And I think part of this is sharing with the patient the uncertainty of, we don't know what's going to happen. We will find out quickly if this doesn't work, and we'll move you to something else. It's back to that piece of paper with all the options on it. Yeah. And I think one of the decisions are, what options do you burn yeah. if you take one drug off the list and use that now, as opposed to keeping it on the yeah. list for, for future reference? Yeah, may, maybe, Mark, we can bring you in and talk, like, how do you use uh, trabectidin in your practice now? What are the diseases you think about based on the FDA approval? Yeah, so with the FD approval, it's, it's identical to what we've discussed, and there isn't anything off. And I think that um, with an FD approval for leiomyosarcoma and liposarcoma, approved as a second-line agent, certainly there is a role for it as a second-line agent. Um, whether or not a patient is concerned about the 24-hour pump, which in my practice has not been a concern, whether or not they're concerned, it, it, the concern for hepatotoxicities. I find that when you, you break it down based on our experience, and, and the funny thing was, I think by the time it came to market, there was such a relief because we've all used it. Um, we've all used it, but it was hard in some years to chase it down and find the access programs. And, and then when the studies were open and the access program restricted some patients and patients weren't eligible for the studies. So it was one of these things where it was out there, but it wasn't always available and sort of created this inequality amongst these leiomyosarcoma and liposarcoma patients. Um, so I certainly approach it as a for leiomyosarcoma, perhaps use it more as a third-line agent. Um, for the lipo, perhaps more as a second. But certainly, they're going to get everything. And so I don't know that splitting it as second, third, fourth makes all that much difference, I think, as long as we use it and use it appropriately. Um, but I do think, and George mentioned this, I mean, for the patient that gets a great response to this, it's such a, it could be a, such a durable response, and it's, it's like nothing else. Um, that it just becomes for the right patient so impressive. The hard thing is how do you determine the right patient? You have to do it in a lot of patients to get the right patient. And this is where I hope molecular diagnostics will give Correct. us an answer. We're still doing the correlative science on the phase three study. And we'd all feel stupid if P53 mutations either predict a better response or a worse response. I think when, when we get the answer, we're going to share it, of course. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a biomarker for that drug, just like we don't have a great biomarker for most of the drugs we're talking about. Yeah. On the order of a, on a blank sheet of paper, I would certainly put uh, trabectidin much higher for a myxoid liposarcoma than for a de-differentiated liposarcoma. And so it, and it is true that at the end of writing these options, I do you know, at, uh, solicit questions for sure, but then also give a recommendation. And, and for a myxoid liposarcoma, it's a great second-line option. Yeah, I agree.